and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce you now. Dr. Aaron Horshig is a sports physical therapist, Olympic weightlifting coach, and strength and conditioning specialist. He is the author of the best-selling book, The Squat Bible, which has been published in multiple languages. His latest book, Rebuilding Milo, is a culmination of his life's work in the weight room. It contains all the knowledge he has amassed over the past decade while helping coach some of the best athletes in the world. As the founder of SquatUniversity.com, Aaron shares his innovative approach to help millions of athletes and coaches across the world to move better, decrease their aches and pains, and reach their true athletic potential. As a physical therapist, he works with elite level Olympic weightlifters and powerlifters, athletes from the NFL and Major League Baseball, and international level soccer players. He is also the host of the Squat University podcast, where he creates even more amazing content. Aaron lives in St. Louis with his wife, Christine. Dr. Aaron Horshig, what an honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. So cool to have you. I've seen pictures of you squatting. Dude, you have the deepest squat I've ever seen, <laughs> and it looks like you could just hang out there for hours. That's amazing. I appreciate it. Yeah, I take, uh, take a lot of pride in my squat and working on it constantly um, and really working on that bottom position. You know, I'm a big, big believer in really expressing your strength through the full range of motion that you have available to you, whether that's mobility and anatomy and being able to sit in the bottom of a deep squat for a long extended time is something that I think can really benefit a lot of people. Yeah, that's awesome. I can't wait to deep dive into that topic uh, with you today. I hope this isn't too graphic, but one one of my favorite trips of the year, uh, me and my buds for the last few years have done a backpacking trip through the Uinas here in Utah. And one of my favorite things about the backpacking trip is going number two in a natural way. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's way awesome, especially in nature. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they don't call it the squatty potty for nothing. That's I mean, right. It's, <laughs> it's nature's way. That's right. Absolutely. It's such an interesting movement. And I, I do believe as a culture, we've really lost that ability to squat and you see pictures of indigenous yep. cultures around the world and you see it comes quite natural to them and we just don't really have it anymore with our lifestyles yeah i mean it's definitely one of those things if you don't use it you lose it i mean we as a as a child growing up you know as a baby everyone has the ability to sit down into a deep squat you know it's one of those fundamental movements and positions that you use and you learn as you are growing and developing you know you crawl you start walking and to even get into a walking position, you have to squat and stand up. You watch a child for more than a couple seconds, you can see them squat down to pick anything off the ground with ease. Um, yet as we get older, I think we we lose that ability often because it's not something that we are required to do throughout our day. We are so used to sitting in chairs. If we see something on the ground, we hinge over to pick it up, which, you know, the hinge itself, it's not that that's a, that's a bad thing at all. It's very efficient. But I think when we lose that fundamental squat as a pattern, as a positioning, you know, it really is a weak link in a lot of people's movement repertoires. Yeah. And I think that when you regain that ability, the ability to, you know, move your body through that full range of motion in the squat pattern, it breeds so much more positive benefits into many other aspects in your life. I think you really um, allow yourselves to uh, start moving as your body was designed. You can find your true strength. You move well, and then you start lifting big weight, which is what sort of the motto of, of Squat University. But, you know, it all comes down to first moving better and using your body as it was designed through a fundamental movement. And one of the things that people will say to the notion that you should be able to squat astrograss as an adult, they'll always say the argument of, well, you know, look at the architecture, the anatomy of a baby in an adult. They're two do totally different things. The baby's head is, you know, so much bigger than adults. Their torso length are very proportionally different. So, you know, we shouldn't have the ability to squat all the way down as an adult. And while there are anatomical changes that happen as we adapt and we get older, you know, that argument is instantly debunked when you go to any culture around the world that does not use chairs often to sit in. You know, you go to China, you're going to see people sitting at the bus stop uh, in a deep squat. My co-author for both of my books, Kevin Santana, his parents are from Laos. He will tell me stories of his mother just sitting in a deep squat to prepare dinner sometimes. You know, so the squat is a fundamental movement that if you start practicing it, uh, at a young age and you don't lose that habit is something that should be able to stay with you for life for most people. 
Yeah, that's amazing. We always do tell people, like, if you want to see real fitness, like, walk down the street and go to the playground and see kiddos on the monkey bar. Not only have they already, like, jettisoned their shoes, but they're moving the way that we all should be moving. Their feet are grabbing, you know, the bars and the, the ground and, you know, all the different ways that they can move. It's just so impressive. And, and you're right, we kind of lose that as we get older. Before we really dive into the squat, which I'm so excited to do with you, I really do want to hear a little bit of your story. When did you fall in love with movement? And when did you know you wanted to make that into your career? Yeah, that's a great question. So for those out there that don't know much about me and my career, I am, I describe myself as a weightlifting nerd turned physical therapist. So um, I fell in love with the weight room probably since the day I walked in. It was the summer between eighth grade and ninth grade. So going into high school, I was invited into the weight room as a sort of like a younger transitioning into, into the football team. Uh, that's your first exposure for a lot of kids into lifting for the first time. And I just instantly fell in love with it. I was never one of those athletes that was extremely strong by any means, but I fell in love with the process of, of learning the lifts and, you know, seeing that strength and the weight go up, um, uh, was just something I instantly became addicted to, uh, flash forward a couple of years. I got into Truman state university, which is a small D2 school up in Northeastern Missouri. And coincidentally, I, did not make the baseball team. I tried to walk onto the baseball team, injured myself while walking on, but found the Olympic weightlifting team the very next day that Truman State had. They were one of the few universities in the entire nation that had an Olympic weightlifting team as a part of the college and just fell in love with it. I competed in Olympic weightlifting for over 11 years before I took a step back just to devote more time to training content with Squat University. But in my pursuit of ultimate strength with Olympic weightlifting, just like most people that walk into the weight room in any pursuits, uh, I was always finding small little injuries, you know, not big ones necessarily, or a few bigger injuries, but nothing terribly bad. It's just small aches and pain. You know, you have that knee pain that creeps up on you or the back pain that takes you out of lifting for a week or two, uh, you know, the elbow pain that's nagging when you're doing presses for a few months, those those small aches and pains that don't necessarily railroad your training completely, but put a big thorn into your side and, and lead you to frustrations. And at the time, you know, this is, I started competing back in 2005, you know, YouTube was just starting the internet as a whole, as far as social media goes, was still very much so in its infancy. There wasn't a lot of great information out there for how to deal with injuries. And I'm sure many of your listeners can attest to the same type of story. You deal with some sort of injury due to being active in a lifestyle and you go to a physician and they'll tell you the same sort of story. Uh, how'd you hurt yourself? Oh, from squatting. Well, you need to stop squatting so much weight. Uh, your, you know, your back hurt from deadlifting. How much were you deadlifting? Oh, that's way too much weight. You, you know, deadlifting is one of the worst things for your, for your back. You know, there's not great uh, medical advice, you know, I, as a whole, obviously there's going to be some that give great advice, but on a whole, you know, there's not great advice out there for people who want to pursue a path of lifting weights and do so, you know, healthily for the rest of their life. So, uh, flash forward a couple more years, I went to the university of Missouri and got my doctorate in physical therapy and decided I wanted to sort of take that path and be the person to start speaking to, uh, strength athletes, you know, cause I was always an athlete before I became a practitioner. I wanted to help people who were in similar situations as myself, sort of be that guide for what I needed back in 2005 when I first started lifting. And I wanted to do so in a way that was a little bit different than the conventional way that most medical and physical rehabilitation practitioners speak to people. And that's, I call it ivory tower speak. Uh, you know, when you, when you see a lot of very educated people on social media speak, uh, you can tell they're very educated. They use language uh, that is, you know, something that may require a lot of people to use a thesaurus or a dictionary to look up what they just said. Um, and I think sometimes that limits their reach and effectiveness in what they're trying to say. I believe that because I was always that lifter and that weightlifting coach ever before I became a physical therapist, I had a unique opportunity to speak to people in a way in which I could use their exact language that they recognized so that I could deliver the information for what could help them, again, decrease their aches and pains, help them move better in the gym and in life and reach their true athletic potential, but do so in a way 
that I could speak to them on their level, not speaking down to them with that ivory tower speak, still using the same information that I would give any patient that comes to me as a physical therapist, but help people understand like, hey, you've got knee pain after doing some heavy loaded squats the other day. Let's figure out why you have that stabbing pain in your knee. You know, let's, here's how you screen your hip mobility because hip mobility has a direct impact on knee stability and knee control and the forces that are accumulating there over time add up blah, 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 blah. So, um, that's really where I started squat university It was all because of my past experience, you know, as a weightlifter, as someone who truly loves lifting heavy weights. And I do so still to this day, still trained as an Olympic weightlifter. I just took a t- step back from competing on the weekends. Um, but trying to be that guide for others out there who have similar desires, whether that's competitive weightlifting, powerlifting, CrossFit, strongman, or you just love going to the gym and and lifting weights because you help, it helps you feel strong and healthy and do all the things you like to do outside of the world, like backpacking and climbing and things like that. You know, the gym is still an avid part of all of that thing. So, um, I wanted to, to be that guide for others so that they can do so healthy and maintain their body as well as possible so that they can still be that person 80 years old, 85, 90, still doing what they love to do and not confined to a wheelchair or skilled nursing facility, because I've seen that happen. You know, going through physical therapy school, I had the unique opportunities to do clinical rotations within a number of different settings. And the number one thing that you see in these uh, skilled nursing facilities are people that are uh, confined to, you know, wheelchairs or to needing help of others just to do simple things throughout their life, not necessarily because they have a horrible disease or, or something like that, but often just because they have lost functional strength. They have resided to uh, living a life where they weren't able to maintain capacity to do simple things, walk up and down stairs, pick their grandchild off the ground. And it really ch- changed their ability to live life fully. So I think regardless of your competitive aspirations with lifting weights, I think the squat and all of its derivatives are fundamental movements that help you build capacity for life. So that's really where I've molded Squat University was my outreach to help be that shining light and that uh, that path, illuminated path along the road to help people live the life that they want to live. That's amazing. Your job satisfaction must be through the roof, dude, to become (laughs) the person that you needed to find back, you know, when you were having those small injuries, it must just be amazing in your day to day to be able to provide that resource for people. And you're right. Like the longevity piece, it's one thing to live a long life, but the, the health span piece of it is so important as well. It's not just important to live a long time. It's important to live well for a long time. And so I'm so glad, so glad that's your focus. And we need so much more of that. Um, you know, sitting behind me is my personal training certification manual that tells me exactly the very one way that anybody should squat. And there's one way to do the squat and that's about it. <laughs> and, and when yes. I got certified, that's true. That was it. And, 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 you know, through my 15 year career, I started to learn, okay, maybe there's other ways to do this, but generally speaking, based on our biomechanics, how should we be performing a squat? Yeah. So there's going to always be fundamentals that work for most people that are teaching points that are a great way to get across the idea of how to squat, uh, that work for almost every single person. So for example, uh, with the bar on your back, if you're performing a back squat, um, you know, we want to make sure that you have a sufficient tension through your upper body. You're not just doing a squat for leg day. You know, this is a full body lift really for any type of squat. Um, we're making sure that we're appropriately using our hips Um, we're keeping our core braced. We're keeping balance as far as, uh, your center of gravity tracking over the middle of your foot. We're keeping our knees in line with our feet. You know, there's, there's fundamentals that I think span across any type of, of lift that you perform, but then become, there's a lot of, uh, if, and, or buts kind of thing, as far as toe angle, there is no golden rule that everyone has to have their toes hundred percent straightforward. You know, that a general guideline for most people of about a seven to like 15 degree toe out, a slight toe out. Again, it works for a lot of people. doesn't work for everyone because there's going to be some people that have uh, excessive femoral retroversion that require a very uh, angled toe position in order for them to maintain 
optimal alignment within their femurs as they squat. Um, as far as the look of a squat from the side, you know, we always want the barbell, if you're performing a barbell squat, to be tracking relatively over the middle of your foot. And what that's going to do is show that your body is in relative balance because as you add more and more weight to the barbell, it's going to pull your entire uh, unit, if you include yourself and the barbell together, the center of gravity is going to be pulled more towards the bar. So that's usually our just general guideline, bar tracking over the middle of the foot. Well, the position that your body makes in that bottom position is going to look a little different for each person. You know, uh, you take that textbook uh, video or picture of a deep squat and you'll see someone probably with their knees a little over their toes, very upright in their posture, um, you know, just that standard silhouette of a deep squat that most people envision. Well, that's not going to look the same for someone who maybe has very poor ankle mobility and extremely long femurs compared to their torso length. They're going to be very much so bent over into like an accordion smashed together position. Um, but again, that's their squat pattern. So there's a lot of fundamentals that we could talk about. And then there's those if and or buts that come in when we talk about variation due to anatomy, due to mobility, due to past injury history. Uh, or even due to exercise selection variation. You could have someone that is performing a high bar back squat versus a low bar back squat and how that's going to manipulate the technique. But if I had to give specific uh, fundamentals that across the board work for almost any squat, there's going to be a few things. Uh, the first one is going to be spinal integrity or torso integrity, sort of core stability. Some people uh, sort of label that. And it's the idea that we want our spine to remain within a neutral posture. We don't want to flex the back excessively, and we don't want to extend the back excessively. We want to, in our standing position, sort of have that neutral spinal posture, and we want to maintain that as much as possible throughout the lift. So you'll see some people at the very bottom of a squat default into a little bit of lumbar rounding. That's that butt wink uh, fault that we want to limit if, as much as possible. Um, so spinal integrity would be number one. Uh, number two, just as a whole, would be balance. Um, again, if you're looking at a squat from the side, we want to have our center of gravity be over the middle of our foot. And that's going to be just our fundamental uh, position point to make sure that our body as a whole is in balance. Um, an interesting fact about that, our center of balance will also be a little bit different body weight versus a barbell squat. So one of the funny things that you'll see from time to time on social media will be someone sort of jammed up against a wall with their hands up high, maybe their toes an inch from the wall, and they're trying to do a squat, not fall over or touch the wall. Um, some people call this uh, squat therapy. I call it a circus act. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the idea that every single person should be able to perform this extremely upright squat without their uh, body touching a wall. And that obviously goes against the idea of balance over your center of gravity, over your midfoot. Some people, depending on their anatomy proportions, need to have their knees go well past their toes, which would hit the wall, or they need to have their chest leaning a good amount forward, which again would hit the wall in order to perform a proper body weight squat based on where their center of gravity is. So um, balance would be number two, making sure that your knees are in optimal alignment with the lower body is going to be uh, number three. We obviously don't want those knees to cave in. So the dreaded knee valgus is not a good idea with your uh, squat, but also in the same sense, we don't want to push the knees too far wide. Uh, we want the knees to be in sort of that optimal alignment so that we can have stacked joints. That's not uh, not only going to be the most helpful for the integrity of the lower body as far as injury wise goes, uh, but it's also going to be the most helpful as far as producing vertical force on the ascent of the squat. Um, and then my last, probably most important one, uh, as far as the squat integrity goes is your feet. And this is a big thing that a lot of people don't even realize because they're always stuck in really clunky shoes. Uh, but your foot needs to be very stable. No matter what type of toe angle you may have, you need your body weight spread across your entire foot, heel, base of the first toe, base of the fifth toe. That's called the tripod foot. 
And in doing so, by establishing a firm foundation with the ground, you set your body up for better movement quality and better performance up the rest of the chain. If you want to think of your foot as the base to a house of cards, the more stable it can be, the wider it can be, the higher you can stack a bunch of cards on top of it, the more integrity there is to the entire structure. Well, a lot of people assume that because they're standing upright that their feet are doing that the best job that they can. When in fact, I would say that's probably one of the most uh, problematic areas for a lot of people is the uh, inability to set their feet in a stable foundation. Their feet are moving all over. And I think in large parts, because we wear horrible shoes on our feet all day long, like Nikes and Adidas that Thank just you. completely pat our feet and, and uh, blind ourselves to the sensation of uh, what our feet should be telling us. Thank you know, your you. foot has, you know, hundreds of bones, muscles, and tendons all, you know, jammed together and tons and tons of sensory rich, uh, uh, you know, organs down in the, in the lower body that are meant to give your body, um, sensation of position of, of movement, of force of load. And when you're wearing a really thick and padded shoe throughout your day, you are blinding yourself. You're blunting yourself to the effects of what your foot is doing to the ground. So, um, being able to set a firm foundation with the ground, no matter what type of squat you're doing is vital to the performance of the motion. Thank you so very much. We just lost Nike as a potential sponsor. We lose a lot of potential sponsors on this show and we just lost them, but I don't care. That is very, very well said. Maybe, I know you've already covered some of this, but maybe this is a good time to kind of start from the very bottom, maybe reiterate a few things that you're looking for in the feet, common things you see, and maybe a few like cues that you use to help people make corrections. And we can start from the foot and kind of work our way up with the different joints. And we can also talk yeah. about which joints need to be, what you've already said, stable, and the difference between stability and mobility, um, I don't think yeah. we can talk about that enough. For sure. So let's first define that. Stability is not strength. That's a big thing a lot of people misunderstand. Stability is your ability to limit excessive or unwanted motion or to control position. Strength is just your ability to produce force. Now, yes, you need to have a sufficient amount of strength in order to produce stability, but uh, most people will incorrectly train their body thinking they're improving strength or st thinking they're improving stability when in reality, they're just making an area of the body stronger. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, when it comes to the core, the uh, muscles that surround the core, there's many of them. You've got your, your rectus, your obliques, your transverse abdominis, your multifidus, you know, your QL. There's a number of different muscles, long and small that surround the spine. Now, Whenever we're performing a squat, we don't want movement to occur at the back, either uh, with a movement like a deadlift. Um, so the way in which we want to approach our core training in that context, uh, context is to stabilize the spine, limit motion, maintain spinal positioning. Okay, So in that context, our approach for training it would be to use different exercises that promote that stability, that tension, uh, much like guy wires that hold up a radio tower, every single muscle that surrounds the spine must have sufficient tension in order to limit motion when the next wind blows through to keep the radio tower upright. In that sense, if I were to do sit-ups, Roman chair back extensions, or medicine ball rotations, like a Russian twist, Every single one of those exercises produces movement. Now, while I am producing force and therefore strengthening the muscles that produce that movement, I'm not necessarily improving those muscles' ability to therefore limit motion when I need them to contract to stabilize the spinal column. So there's actually research that's been done that shows that isometric exercises like a plank or a bird dog will have better carryover to improving stability of the spine than performing a dynamic strength exercise that moves the spine. So again, it's the idea of strength and stability are two totally different concepts, a little overlap, but still different contexts as far as the long-term potential of what you're trying to do. Mobility is a little bit different than flexibility as well, because flexibility is just the ability of a muscle to elongate and back. So if I take my hamstrings and I stretch them as far as I can, I'm seeing how, how far can I move my leg and elongate the leg. Mobility is specifically talking more so about joint motion and your ability to, again, move through a range of motion. So again, 
those can be intertwined a little bit as well, because if I look at calf flexibility, specifically the soleus muscle, which is the smaller muscle underneath the big gastroc muscle that you see from the outside, if a soleus muscle is very stiff and inflexible, it can limit ankle mobility. Now, the reason mobility is important to understand is because the way in which we approach improving it will create the desired change or not. I can work on flexibility all day long, and I will not always see long-term improvements in mobility. So the difference would be if I step on a slant board to stretch my calf muscles, will it automatically help me get a better squat? Now, the squat requires ankle mobility. So the way in which you are training that sometimes is going to be a little bit different. Sometimes there'll be a little bit of carryover, but the end idea with mobility training is that we are weight-bearing and we are using the body through a full range of motion. We're not just hanging out aimlessly, stretching a muscle for 30 seconds. So it has a movement component. Now, you talked about going back to the foot with very specific cues. Whenever we're looking at the foot, again, we talked about that tripod structure. The most important piece of advice I could give anyone when it comes to foot stability is to get out of your shoes and start squatting barefoot. Now, if you want to use a pair of of shoes when you are squatting heavier weight because you like the stability, maybe the grip on the ground, or you like wearing a pair of weightlifting shoes like you're a CrossFitter or an Olympic weightlifter, there's nothing wrong with that. But I would say far too often, people have no idea what the ground feels like underneath their feet whenever they are squatting because they are always in shoes. So just even warming up barefoot for your first set or two can have dramatic carryovers and return on investment compared to just always having your shoes on. Uh, That will require some people probably change gyms because I don't think you can go barefoot in Planet Fitness. So I may have caused another uh, another big company to leave your sponsorship. They're out. List. They're out. Shoot. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, you might set off the lunk alarm there. But the <laughs> idea, right. I think, is that um, by being barefoot, you're going to expose your body to the new sensations that you've probably never had before. What you're looking for is when you're setting your foot into a stable position, is you want to almost grip the ground, not curl your toes, but squeeze the ground down and that's going to create an active foot. So anyone, you don't even have to be in a gym to do this. Just take your shoes off, get barefoot, grab some hard ground and just feel what it feels like to drive your feet into the ground. Like you're creating, becoming one with the ground. People will use the term rooting the ground, like roots to a tree. And that's truly what happens when you're using your foot actively during a squat or really any lift is you are creating that stability like roots going into the ground from a tree. Um, A couple things that I will often see people do incorrectly is they will, um, because they're in very narrow shoes, they won't be able to have their toes splay out. So that's another thing that why Nike and Adidas are so bad for most people's feet is because they're way too dang narrow. Uh, your toes are meant to spread out. You know, if you look at a baby's foot, when it, when the baby is first born, uh, their toes are the widest part of their entire feet. Uh, but as we get older and we start wearing these ridiculously narrow toed shoes, your foot adapts to the position that the shoe is putting it into negatively hurting your ability to use your foot as it was designed. So the function of your foot is, is minimized. And when it comes to a movement like the squat, Again, sort of like that house uh, house of cards. The wider your foot can be, the more stability you can derive. So when you have a narrow-toed shoe, uh, it significantly decreases your foot's ability to spread out and create the needed foundation for the rest of your body. So I, I guess the tip of the day would be get out of your shoes, uh, get under a barbell, and just perform very slow tempo squats feel for what's going on at your foot. When you do like a 10 second negative squat or a 10 second eccentric, it allows you to really become aware of the position of your foot, whether or not you're shifting too far into your toes, too far back into your heels, whether your foot's collapsing over uh, or too far on its side. You know, it, it allows you to become uh, very in the moment and realize what's going on at your foot. And an interesting thing that a lot of people will uh take away from something like this is that when we're talking about foot stability, again, 
we're always sort of connecting the body link by link. That's why they call things the kinetic chain. When you set your foot in a good position, you do so not just by thinking about the foot, but what you do all the way up the rest of your body. Uh, when you create an arch in your foot, you do so because you externally rotate at the hip and you set yourself in a more stable position from the hip down. Your knees all of a sudden assume a better position. If that foot collapses over, so that arch excessively pronates, what happens? The knee comes in. The hip moves into a little bit more internal rotation. It loses that integrity for stability through the joint, which then leads to less glute activation that will then help stabilize the pelvis and the rest of the back. So really all these things, we talk about them uh, you know, exclusively sometimes, but they're very much so linked with the rest of the body. And what you do at one joint directly impacts what happens at another joint. So the barefoot lifting that I'm talking about is something not only to help improve your foot stability, improve your squat, but also teach you ways in which you're using your body as a whole that will breed into so many other areas of your life, not only lifting, but also just movement wise. Wow. That's amazing. None of that would have made any sense to me at the foot before I transitioned over to minimalist shoes and walking barefoot outside. It's an absolute yeah. game changer. You, you realize, you know, your feet can spread out, they can recover and you, you, yeah. you get that sense of grabbing the ground. It's so interesting. And you talk about the kinetic chain and we couldn't agree more. Like we've got posters of all the anatomy chains downstairs, downstairs in our home gym and helping people understand how your tongue is connected to your big toe and how all of these, you know, trains in your body connect to each other. It's really remarkable and it helps people connect the dots. Like, Oh, I'm experiencing pain in my right shoulder, but that might be coming from my left hip, which is kind of mind blowing, but is absolutely true. Yeah, it really is. You know, and that's one of the big things as a physical therapist that I learned early on in my career was that when someone comes into you with an injury, you don't look directly at the site of pain. You know, so many times people come to me with uh, knee pain and I'll go through an entire examination and I won't touch their knee. And they'll be like, wait, you know, you, do, do you want to poke around like the, like the doctor I went to before did? And I'm like, no, I don't need to. You told me everything I need to know. And then I watched the way you move and I checked out the joints above and below. We prefer, you know, perform different tests. I don't need to poke around on your knee because that doesn't tell me anything I don't already know as far as what's going wrong, why this was caused and what weak links we need to focus on in order to fix things. Mm, yeah, that's so well said. Um, I think we've covered the foot and the ankle sufficiently, unless there's something else you want to say about the ankle, but I really do want to cover the knee. What's going on at the knee during a squat? Yeah. So the knee, obviously most people will look at it as a direct, uh, like a one or two dimensional motion. It's going to flex and extend, but there's also a little bit of rotation that's occurring at the knee joint. Uh, the biggest thing we want to focus on with the knee is again, understanding that it is being controlled for based on your foot and ankle complex and your hips. Too often, people will focus on their knees that may be like uh, maybe caving in or, or things like that, and they try to just focus on the knees. When you focus on solidifying your foot stability and then also focusing on optimizing hip stability at the start of the lift by getting those glutes engaged, the knee will go where it needs to. It doesn't matter if it goes over your toes. Uh, as long as you stay balanced, the knees will go where they need to. So again, I would hope by now, it's 2022, that most people know your knees can go over your toes. Unfortunately, I'm still reminded every single day on social media <laughs> by people commenting, uh, my trainer or my doctor told me the knees should not go over the toes. That's a complete myth. There is nothing wrong with the knees going over your toes as long as you are balanced and you progressively load it correctly into that position, your body can adapt just fine. Uh, just as an anecdotal evidence note, I mean, if, if knees over toes was a bad thing, there are millions and millions of weightlifters all around the world that need to be stopped immediately because that is a common position that weightlifters get into on a daily basis with a ton of load doing a snatch, clean, or squat. Wow. Yeah. That's so interesting. I, I don't understand why my personal training manual says that the knee can't cross the toe. That's how I coached it for so many years. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's really interesting. Where, where do these myths come from? And I, I, you know, embedding that there was a well-intentioned person early on 
that sort of started populating this myth. And here's probably if I had to take a stab in the dark where it came from. Someone probably came to them and they had a horrible squat. They had never been shown on a squat before and they were like tipping up on their toes and just completely off balance. They said, hey, you know, they put their hands in front of their knees. They said, don't let your knees hit my hands. And all of a sudden, what did they do? They squatted with a hip hinge for the first time and they looked more balanced. So they said, aha, you know, that's the way to go. We, you know, don't let the knees pass the toes and we fix the problem. When in fact, all you did was teach someone how to use their hips a little bit more and you manipulated the movement pattern, but you didn't address the true problem. And it's the same way as saying, oh, you have a sprained ankle. Let's put some ice on it. Do you feel better? Yes. Okay. We fixed the problem. No, you just blunted pain temporarily. You didn't fix the problem at all. So, um, you know, when it comes to knees over toes, it's all about balance. It's just all about maintaining your quality of control and the knees will go where they need to based on your level of mobility and your anatomy. Some people will have very long tibias and shorter femurs. And if they cannot allow their knees to fall over their toes, they're going to fall backwards. They need that knee over toe transition in order to remain balanced and perform just the basic squat. Yeah. I mean, that's so embedded in culture. Like you wouldn't expect somebody who grew up in an area where yoga was really, you know, popular and really fit that body to be, you know, in the Olympics for powerlifting. Like you just don't see that. Likewise, you don't really see a lot of really great yogis that come from Bulgaria. Like people's bodies are built differently in the way that they evolved. And, and yeah, I think that's so smart to be able to identify that and work with people for where they are and how they're moving. I do want to talk about the hips a little bit. This is an interesting one because there is a mobility component but there's also, like you just mentioned, a stability component in the hips as well. How do we improve both? That is very true. Now, if I stand corrected, you have talked with Dr. Stuart McGill on your podcast before, oh, correct? yeah, he's amazing. I'm sitting and next to I'm, back I'm, mechanic I'm, right now. And I'm sure uh, Stu alluded to the Scottish hip. Yep, he did. There you go. So for the listeners out there who have not listened to that episode, which I would tell you, go back and listen to that because Stu is a mind unlike anyone else's. He's you know, been a constant, constant source of inspiration in my own learning over the years. But when we look at the hip, we have to understand anatomy and we have to understand mobility. Now, from the anatomy standpoint, think about your hip like a ball rolling on a piece of dinnerware. Now, uh, some people have a hip anatomy structure that is like a ball rolling on a plate. So it's a very flat structure and this ball can just roll all around. Uh, those people have what's called more so on the line of a diplastic hip. So hip dysplasia is a problem within the hip where the anatomy is just so open that sometimes these people can find issues like, you know, their their hips can almost dislocate sometimes. So it can be problematic to a point. But um, basically, these people anatomically have a lot of freedom of movement at the hip joint. Now, on the opposite edge of that spectrum, you have people who would have that ball rolling around a bowl. So obviously the ball is going to smack into the edges of the bowl. It can't move nearly as much. So that person has a deeper hip socket. And there's been epidemiological studies done on different populations across the world where they have seen different levels of hip dysplasia, different percentages of hip dysplasia. And what Stu often alludes to is the couple studies that have shown uh, people in the Celtic areas of the world, so your uh, your Scotland, your Ireland, uh, areas like that, that are uh, notorious for having a very high percentage of deeper hip sockets, very low hip dysplasia percentages. Whereas you have other areas of the world, like Bulgaria or the Eastern Bloc, uh, of, of Europe that have very high percentages of hip dysplasia. Now, coincidentally, because that gives you so much freedom of movement at the hip anatomically, uh, we also seem to see some of the best weightlifters in the world, Olympic weightlifters from those areas of the world. Now, why would that be you know, possible? It's because the linkage of Olympic weightlifting and mobility is so important because Olympic weightlifting requires extreme mobility of the ankles and the hips in order to get in the deep receiving positions for the snatch or clean. So the more mobility you have, the deeper you can receive a snatch or clean, the more weight you can theoretically lift. So uh, it's an interesting thing that the same anatomy that can potentially set someone up for a future injury, if it is too great, Uh, can also be what really sets an athlete up for having the potential to be a great weightlifter. Um, 
Now, we also have mobility, and this is going to be more so uh, related to the flexibility of the soft tissue uh, structures that surround the hip. So you have a number of different muscles that attach to the hip joint. You also have uh, structures like your hip capsule. Um, there's a number of different ligaments around that area, and all of those can influence uh, the level of mobility. Some of those can be uh, manipulated more so than others. Uh, for example, you're probably not going to see as much ligament change uh, flexibility-wise than a muscle. Um, hip capsule, some people believe that, you know, depending on the load duration, long term, over time, depending on the type of movements you're doing, we could potentially see changes in, in capsule integrity that could create a little bit more mobility for some people. Uh, but the idea is that um, understanding, first off, your mobility allows you to have a good understanding for what's possible. For example, I have a fairly shallow hip socket. I can sit my butt on my heel, as you alluded to earlier in the podcast. Um, I also have a friend that I will shoot podcasts with sometime, uh, or shoot podcasts, shoot uh, YouTube videos with sometimes. His name's Ed. Um, and Ed has a very deep hip socket. The guy can barely get below parallel without just his hip joint running out of room. Uh, and I will make the joke sometimes, you know, unfortunately, Ed's not going to be an Olympic weightlifter anytime soon. And it's just the reality that some people were born with anatomy. And as they grow and develop, uh, their anatomy changes and allows for a different type of, of squat pattern. Now, that doesn't mean that Ed with his deep hip socket shouldn't squat or can't squat deep ever again. He just only has so much potential. But I get that guy a pair of weightlifting shoes with a raised heel and work on his squat angle, he can get a little bit below parallel and it looks good. And then he trains within that you know realm. He's always using through his full body what his potential is. He's working on that strength. He's not just settling for a high squat for the rest of his life. He's trying to optimize the motion that his body has available to him, knowing there's certain things he can improve, like mobility, and there's certain things he will never improve, like anatomy short mm. of surgery, right? Yeah. Now, the one thing that most people need to understand is that because some people will be like, oh, I have deep hip sockets too. I'm just like Ed. Most people have not yet reached their end potential with mobility and flexibility work. So don't assume just because you test a certain way that, all right, that's it. I'm just, I mean, that's, that's the end of limitation. There's almost always something you can do to see even more improvement. Now, that mobility and flexibility improvement is going to take time. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have to work at it, but there is always potential for most people to still improve their depth if they have a specific anatomical limitation that they were born with. Wow. Yeah. And I love that. I love that approach of just using what you have available and doing the best you can with it. And that there is always a way to make it just a little bit better. Uh, what a great yeah. explanation. As we move up, you were talking a little bit earlier about core stability. And I have to say like some of the exercises you were mentioning, like planks, they're, they're kind of hard and I don't really like to do them. And it's really easy for me to put on a weight belt. Why, why do we need core stability if we can just, you know, use a weight belt when we're lifting heavier weights? Yeah, that's a big thing. Uh, you're not using a weight belt first off throughout your entire day, or at least I hope you're not. <laughs> it has a um, slimming course, feature. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, core stability is using your body as it was designed. Most people have never heard this before, but you were born with a weightlifting belt, a natural weightlifting belt. And it's called your torso. And if you use your muscles correctly, you can stabilize your spine like crazy and increase intra-abdominal cavity pressure or IAP to stabilize your spine. You don't need a weightlifting belt. Now, a weightlifting belt does add another layer of stiffness across your abdomen, which can help uh, people who are trying to lift max numbers. Uh, but for most people, you do not need a weightlifting belt. Um, I actually, uh, I've changed my mind a little bit about this over the years to even say now, probably most people, unless you are a competitive lifter, a power lifter, a weight lifter, a crossfitter, a strongman, or a bodybuilder. I mean, you are trying to lift big weights, or maybe you don't compete, but your goal is I like to lift heavy. I'm trying to reach my max potential. If that is not you, you should not be wearing a weightlifting belt ever. You need to be optimizing your body's natural weightlifting belt because you are using the gym 
to get better at life, at living functional life and maybe, you know, looking better, feeling better. Your goal is not performance for the sake of competition. So those people do not need a weightlifting belt. Your uh, weightlifting belt is not going to decrease your injury risk. It's not going to keep your back from rounding. Uh, it is only there for performance. Uh, your weightlifting belt naturally, which is your core, uh, when used appropriately, is what will actually keep you safe and keep you healthy uh, for the rest of your life. Yeah, I absolutely love that. That's fantastic advice. I guess I'll have to do a plank now. Tell us a little bit about what is going on at the shoulders and the wrists during a squat and what you're looking for there. Yeah, so it depends on the type of lift that you're performing, obviously, with what's going to go on at the shoulders. But the big thing to understand is that your upper body is very engaged during a squat. A lot of people just assume that because the squat is something that you do with your lower body, that it's not in a full body lift. And that's completely wrong. Your upper body is very engaged or should be very engaged during a squat. Uh, provides the platform from which the bar sits on top of. A couple of things I like to see is, you know, your wrist in a relative neutral position. I don't want to see them extremely extended. I don't want to see those elbows shooting back real far behind the body. I want your arms in relative alignment with the backside of your torso um, and your shoulder blades sort of pulled together. Something uh, that I was told by um, one of the greatest power lifters of all time, um, who wrote a book, um, with Dr. Stuart McGill, he would always say, um, to wedge yourself against the bar. So when you pull yourself under the bar, you are actively using your upper body to pull yourself into the bar, to squeeze and basically engage your entire upper back to be rock solid. Then you stand up with the bar. Um, and really, you know, you talk to any single power lifter out there, a weightlifter, they'll tell you the importance of your upper back, your shoulders, your arms in the squat pattern. So I think the biggest myth bust for a lot of people is realizing, hey, if you want to have a good squat, you need to learn how to optimize your stability and your engagement of your upper body whenever you lift. Are there specific search situations, excuse me, where you would recommend a front squat over a back squat? You know, I think it really depends on your goals. I mean, they're both amazing lifts. There's plenty of times though, like you said, uh, or like you mentioned, where maybe we need to change things up. Uh, a person who may be dealing with a back injury that can't tolerate as much sheer loading may tolerate a front squat much better than a back squat. Uh, someone who maybe had a specific type of injury um, to their upper body may not be able to get the bar on their back in a very specific way. So there's the, the notion that everyone has to back squat is also a myth. You know, the squat, uh, unless you're a power lifter and you compete in the back squat, the, uh, the squat as a whole is, can be many different variations. So, uh, front squat, back squat, overhead squat, belt squats, safety bar squats. There's so many different variations. Yeah, that's great. And, and great segue. I was going to ask you about pushing the bar up and overhead and doing overhead squats. What are things we need to be looking for there? Gosh, just the, the big thing, again, is maintaining that optimal alignment. If you were to view your squat from the side, making sure that the bar remains over the middle of your foot um, and your entire upper body is engaged, not shrugging up against the bar, um, but making sure that you're just uh, completely at one with the, with the lift. Mm -hmm. I've got an entire YouTube video uh, explaining a little bit more of the sequences of the overhead squat if that's uh, not a great visual, sometimes a little bit more of the visual learning can be helpful for some people. I have used a ton of your YouTube videos. They are very helpful. Um, I've sent them out to a lot of clients and they help them as well. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough to do this in an audio format when you're not seeing these things, but I <laughs> highly, highly recommend the listener go over to the YouTube channel and subscribe and you'll get such amazing content over there. Um, oh, so, so for you personally, if you had three exercises to do for the rest of your life in order of priority, what were, what would the three exercises be for you for the rest of your life? For me personally, it would be probably the back squat, the clean and the or clean and jerk and the snatch. I just love the Olympic lifts. They're so fun to perform. It's always, I mean, I've been, I started doing the Olympic lifts in uh, competing in the fall of 2005. And I'm still learning every single day how to get better at them. I mean, I, I don't know many other pursuits that after being in a specific type of, uh, you know, event for, for 17 years and you're still like, wow, this is, this is fun. This is something new, uh, that you're, you're still doing. 
Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Having a very, very, very rudimentary level of coaching those movements, they seem endlessly technical. And it's almost like a short track speed skater saying like, I have been to the Olympics and I have not skated the perfect lap. Like, yeah. it seems like there's endless things to tweak and work on and kind of address while you're working on those very dynamic movements. Exactly. Wow, that's awesome. So I, I'm wondering, we just talked about your YouTube content. You do all kinds of content on Instagram. You've got the podcast, which is amazing. I've been crushing it from the beginning. Thank you. Um, it's so good. I believe you've hosted Stu McGill as well. Is that right? Oh, I've talked with Stu like, I think five times before oh, on my podcast. Yeah. So that's great. yeah, we, we, we talk a lot and collaborate. That's great. Yeah. I'm listening to it from the very beginning. And so I saw it, you know, in scrolling through in passing. And so I, I thought that was super cool, but, but you the series that you did at the very beginning where you're breaking these things down. Um, I mean, it's amazing that we're going to keep this conversation to an hour because I've heard you explode all of these topics into, <laughs> in, into yeah. hour long sessions of, of explaining like some of these tiny things to be thinking about, which I think is absolutely amazing. Yeah. I'm curious curious, like how, how in the world are you able to put out so much content in so many different formats? And why do you do that for free? <laughs> uh, how am I able to do it? Uh, it is my entire life. So uh, on top of working 40 hours a week as a physical therapist in clinic, like all I do is create content. It's, it's truly my passion. So it doesn't feel like another job. Um, so, I mean, any second that I get that's free, I'm creating content, I'm responding to people, I'm making something new. So, I mean, I couldn't even add up the amount of hours I put into Squat University just because it's it's so much fun to do. I don't even keep track of time. Yeah. Um, that's that's the how. I'm constantly working. <laughs> um, uh, the, the why, uh, you know, again, I always think back to if I was 18 years old again and starting my weightlifting career you know, and I, my knee was hurting, you know, what, what would I try to be searching for? And what, what help did I need? And I want to be that person that provides that guidance to that person, because I know what it feels like when you get a piece of advice from someone that it's just completely free and they're it, whatever they gave you helped you get out of pain and get back to doing what you love doing. And that's priceless. And that's something that sticks with you for the rest of your life. So if I can be that person for anyone else, you know, that's, that's all the things I need. I don't need, you know, that $2 million deal from something to be able to, to continue producing content. And, you know, I mean, you got to make a living, but I think the long-term uh, impact that I hope to make uh, in the world of specifically strength sports, but of just anyone walking the way room, that is more important to me uh, than any monetary uh, revenue could ever be. So my content will always remain uh, completely free for people. I, I do have, obviously, like you mentioned, two books that I've written. And, and obviously, there'll be more other products and fun things to come in the future. But uh, as far as the bulk of my information, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, podcast, you know, every single day, I try to put out helpful content that help people do three things, move better in the gym and in life, decrease their body's aches and pains and help them reach their true athletic potential. Dude, that's amazing. The world needs more people like you for sure. That's so yeah. cool. I love that approach. Tell us a little bit about your books, The Squat Bible and your latest, Rebuilding Milo. Yeah, so the first book was The Squat Bible. It came out in March of 2016 or 17, I believe. And uh, basically, it's just like what we talked about today. It breaks down the body from head to toe, talking about the squat pattern, and it gives people... Um, a really quick read, it's only 128 pages, into ways in which they can screen their body and uncover issues. You have a problem squat, how do you know if it's your ankles? Here's how you do a quick screen. What did you find if you came up short? Here's what you do. So a couple different exercises to help improve ankle mobility kind of thing with the idea of let's move well first, then let's start loading up with the barbell squat. Uh, rebuilding Milo was a much deeper dive. Uh, it's close to 420 pages, I believe. And it basically is my approach to physical therapy. So it allows you, if you have you know, knee pain one day, you're going to pick up, you're going to turn to chapter five, and that's on the knee. You're going to learn about the knee uh, in the way in which I try to teach it. You're going to go through the exact same test that I would bring someone through if they were in my clinic. And you're going to learn based on what you find what specific things led to your knee pain and which things you need to work on in order to get out of pain. So it's sort of my uh, approach to physical therapy all bundled up into a small book. And that's something that uh, came out in January of 2021. 
And uh, the cool thing about rebuilding Milo is it's going to be sort of a living book in that, you know, every couple of years based on my, uh, you know, continued progression and how I teach people and how I can improve the efficiency of, of how I approach things, um, I'll be able to update the book and, and have future editions that uh, continue to, to make the, the piece of, of work uh, just that much better. That's incredible. Uh, so what is the one thing you want the reader to take away from that book? Is it that they can heal themselves through, you know, reading the book and understanding how the body works? Yeah. I mean, basically the analogy that I got from uh, Kelly Starrett, if, if I'm sure some of your listeners know who that is, was, uh, you know, you shouldn't have to call an electrician to change a light bulb in your house. And really what it comes down to is a lot of the aches and pains we get as people who walk into the weight room they are things that we should be able to take care of. They are not medical emergencies. Uh, there's a time and a place to go to the emergency room or to go to your physician. But for most things, you should have the ability to understand your body and how you can take the right steps to help yourself start feeling better. That's great. You said something earlier that I really want to kind of reiterate. I think it's so important, not only with weightlifting, but on many different facets of life. And that is falling in love with the process. Tell the listener a little bit about why that's so important to fall in love with the process versus just focusing on the end result. Gosh, the big thing is that you're going to be in this game for a long time. I mean, when we're, when we're new to, to weight training, it's, uh, it's easy to become overly concerned with trying to see the numbers rise on the bar. And then you you talk to some of these people that have been in the game for a long time. I love having conversations with older power lifters or older physicians who have, you know, treated people like that. And they always say, you know, you have time. You don't have to rush the process because when you fall in love with, you know, the process of things, it's going to be more enjoyable. I mean, think about, let's say you have a competition every so many months. I mean, 99% of your day-to-day -day habits are the process. And if you're not enjoying every single aspect of it, you're not going to uh, fully be uh, enjoying life and having a good time with it. You know, I, I love going and having practice. You know, I, I get so much more out of practice than I do the competition. Obviously, I love competition, but I get so much out of the, just the process of practicing and getting better. So I think when you fall in love with that, good things happen long term. Not only are you in enjoying life more often, but I think you're going to see a lot more progress in, in your lifting or any other athletic pursuit that you have. And you're going to find less injury because you're actually uh, focused on taking the time to do the little things that most people don't think are as important. I love that. And that's where all the value is, is putting in the work and, and really earning the right to accomplish some of these things, I think is absolutely fantastic. This conversation has been absolutely fantastic. I've learned a ton and have been so honored to host you on our show. What is one simple tip that you would like to leave with the listener from this conversation that they could apply in their lives? Uh, go barefoot more often and sit in a deep squat throughout the day. I <laughs> love it. <laughs> I absolutely love that. That's great. Dr. Aaron Horshig, where can people go to find you and connect with you and your work? man. Type Squat University anywhere on the internet and you'll find me. I'm on every single social media app. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. If you can think of it, I'm on it. That's awesome. We will link to that in the show notes. Dr. Aaron Horsey from Squat University. Thank you so very much for all of your work and all of your research and for putting out so much amazing content, a lot of it for free. We are so appreciative of you. It's such a helpful resource to send our clients to and, and to learn from. So thank you so very much for everything that you do. And thank you for taking the time to appear on our show today. We really appreciate you. Hey, thank you for having me on. It was a great chat. Yeah, it was great. This has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.
As always, thank you so very much for listening to Boundless Body Radio. It's really inspiring and amazing to see some of the reviews that we have been getting and also to receive so many messages and emails about how these episodes have improved our listeners' lives. And so thank you so very much. We are so happy to bring these episodes to you and provide them for free. And we really hope that they help you in your life. Uh, We have just passed two major milestones, which is absolutely mind-blowing to me. And basically, we did both of these in pretty much the exact same day. We have just passed 100,000 downloads worldwide of Boundless Body Radio, and we have just launched our 250th episode, which is absolutely amazing. Like I said, I never imagined we could reach that many people. We always want to keep you updated on things that we're doing on our website. So if you go to myboundlessbody.com, you can always see what we're up to. This month, we have a link that you can go and schedule a functional movement screen, which we do virtually over Zoom. A functional movement screen is a series of seven different movements and three different clearing tests, which is designed to find weak links in the body, such as muscle imbalances and joint stability issues. It's a really great tool for discovering inefficient movement. And even if you're not experiencing pain in certain areas, of your body. It's something that can prevent injury later on. Some muscles need to be stretched, some need to be strengthened, and we can help you create a plan around that so that you can stay healthy and continue to move well for the rest of your life. So again, you can go and schedule that at myboundlessbody.com. You will also see the other services that we offer. You can always schedule a complimentary 30-minute consultation with us to really chat about anything that you like. And remember, if you are enjoying Boundless Body Radio, please take a minute, give us a rating or review on Apple. It really helps get this passion project out to other people. And thank you again for tuning into Boundless Body Radio.